Welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, May 20th. Looking at significant wave heights for the South Pacific Ocean, we see an area of 20 to 22 foot seas southeast of New Zealand, not really doing a whole lot, certainly not capable of generating swell. Otherwise, we see what appears to be a developing pattern building for the Tasman Sea, but we'll get into that in a little bit. We'll start looking at jet stream level winds. These winds up about 30,000 feet help support the formation of gales. When the gales form, help direct their track. We're looking for a trough. We certainly don't see that. You can't tell, but just barely down here at the bottom, this is the southern branch of the jet stream, fully tracking over Antarctica and literally ridging south, offering no support for gale development in the greater uh, South Pacific Ocean. That said, see right out here off the charts, a trough starting to develop, but this looks like it's targeting more New Zealand than uh, anywhere in our normal forecast area. So we'll, we'll just roll this out here, and you see for sure a well-developed trough come Monday being fed by 150 knot winds pushing north right up to just about uh, Tasmania. That would support a clockwise flow aloft at the surface, and, and in the southern hemisphere, clockwise flow is low pressure. And that would be aloft and down at the surface. And, of course, that would help generate winds. Winds generate seas. Seas, as they radiate away from the fetch area, would produce swell. And swell, when it hits a beach, creates surf. Okay, so Monday looks like there is potential for troughing in the Tasman Sea. But notice the jet is pushing hard south. This is another what they call ridge, exact opposite of trough. That supports high pressure aloft and pushes the storm track into, in this case, it would be Antarctica, pretty much shutting down the entire South Pacific Ocean relative to California and Hawaii. Anyway, trough pushing, building up into New Zealand come Tuesday, and then almost starting to pinch off. You see the ridge continues east of there. That fades. Here comes another semi-trough on Wednesday being fed by 120-knot winds. And then that does the same sort of thing, gets cut off here. And you see the well-developed ridge pushing south into Antarctica. This is on Thursday. And then another trough, again trying on Friday. Notice, though, the troughs each time push a little bit more to the east. But still, big ridge over uh, the, the entire South Pacific Ocean. Look at that. The whole way from south of New Zealand to a point south of Chile, effectively shutting things down. And then let's see. Notice now we do have a bit of a trough come Saturday. That's almost a week out trying to push into the South Pacific. And does it make it? Well, sort of. But notice there's this, it's very pinched. Winds start fading. And at 180 hours out, it looks like, yeah, maybe there's some potential long term, but nothing obvious. So here's the northern branch of the jet stream. It's running from east to west on about the 25 uh, south latitude line. And so basically, the short of it, the entire South Pacific locked down by high pressure. At least that's what it looks like in the upper atmosphere. The entire focus would be on the Tasman Sea for the coming week. Let's go take a look down at the surface. Here we are, surface level pressure, surface level winds. Very benign pattern over the South Pacific. Yeah, a couple of little patches here, 30 knot winds. So that's not enough. And the broader area, 30 knot winds, is all pushing south here. That's uh, east of New Zealand and rather calm state over the Tasman Sea. But let's keep our eyes there. And sure enough, as we get into Monday, broad area of 30 to 40 knot winds pushing up into the Tasman Sea. Fiji sitting right about here. That would be the more than likely target. Of course, New Zealand and, and other islands in the area. But Fiji would probably be the main focus for swell. 40 knot winds as we get into Monday night. Lifting north, 35 knot winds into Tuesday, fading. That one gone. Here comes the next one pushing under New Zealand Tuesday night. 50 knot winds aimed right up into the Tasman Sea. Where's Fiji, we said? Uh, I think it's hiding right behind the tag right there. There it is. This aimed pretty well in that direction as we get into Wednesday. 45 to 50 knot winds, 40. 45 knot one winds lifting north into Thursday. Notice high pressure and everything in the g general uh, South Pacific just pushed way down south. Keep your eyes on this little guy over here. There's some potential there. Okay, and as we get into Friday, another system developing. 45 knot winds south of Tasmania aimed right up into the Tasman Sea again. And a little gale. 
uh, actually pretty decently broad, but well outside the California swell window. South winds, 40 to 45 knots targeting eh, Peru, Chile. That's about it. Building with 55 knot winds uh, right up alongside the coast there of southern Chile and uh, 40 to, yeah, 35 to 40 knot winds there in the Tasman Sea continuing. That all fades out. Now, here we do see a little fetch here. Let's go back. This is didn't really catch this before. Still pretty much outside the California swell window. 40 knot winds in the far southeast Pacific. And eh, fading, it's, for the most part, this is out of the California swell window. We'll have to look at the uh, wave model chart, see if that really develops any seas of interest. Anyway, rolling out, that's probably the only hope. Oops, and there we go, 180 hours out and nothing else on the charts. Looks like a, some sort of a tropical system falling south here come Sunday into Monday. Uh, that would be northeast of New Zealand. Again, no concern to us. All right, let's go take a look at the wave model charts. So before we go to the uh, uh, the forecast charts, we're looking at the hindcast charts. We're going back a week, Sunday, May 13th. Actually, this is 06Z. The 0Z had this system here. What is this? This is 38-foot seas. It was actually almost 40-foot seas south of New Zealand six hours earlier. This is a uh, system that has produced swell. It's a two-part storm, and we'll just go through it. Here's the first part. When it pushed under New Zealand, created pretty good seas. Actually, swell from this has already hit Hawaii. It's a decent-sized surf there, you know, overhead a little bit, um, uh, but mainly sideband energy hitting Hawaii. Anyway, this system pushed off into Sunday, started fading, then redeveloped on Monday. And here's the neat thing. It started lifting north a little bit with what's that up to 44 foot seas 46 foot seas late monday night this is monday last week lifting north more uh 12z on tuesday 42 foot seas and then uh fading from 38 foot seas on tuesday and then fading from there also but you can see, still holding into Wednesday with 30, 32, 34 foot seas over a small area. Pretty good long run of southern swell, pushing well to the north, expected for California, uh, Mexico, down into Central America and South America. Also, take note here, let's go back a little bit. No, the first, this is the first of a series of multiple storms. It's already happened, happened last Tuesday. What is that? That was 48 foot seas tracking, un, not even, it was southwest of Tasmania. Still, that is on the Great Circle path up into Fiji here, right like that. The path curves. But you can, we'll just run through this. You can see 43 foot seas, and then fading into 34, 35 foot seas then fading under New Zealand. That swell is in the water. It's hit, hitting Fiji now. We're waiting for reports back to find out exactly how big it was. But the assumption is pretty decent size swell. And we have some uh, Jason 2 satellite data from this uh, storm. This is the long one that ran across the South Pacific and up into the central South Pacific with swell heading towards California. So here we are, 18Z Saturday. Here's when the seas were 40 feet. No satellite passes. But then on 0Z Sunday, did get a satellite pass here. Uh, average seas in this area, 15 reading average, 39 feet with a peak to f one reading to 44.5 feet in this area. Seas were 34, predicted about 36 foot. So uh, that was higher than what was expected per the model. That's good news. And then we got yet another pass six hours after that. Season per the model were 34, let's say 35 feet under this pass. Average measurement, 15 reading, 35.8 feet with a single reading to 40.9 feet. Again, confirming what the model predicted, if not beating it slightly. And then another pass, 0Z Monday. Here we go. Here's the track. Here's what was left of the storm. It faded 28 foot seas. The average measurement, here we go, get Get that down there. Average measurement, 25.5 feet with a peak reading of 28.5 feet. So the model overhyped it just a little bit. Then on 18Z Monday, another pass. This is great to have this many passes, even on a relatively small system. 30, 32, 34, let's say 36 foot seas right here. The model, 15, I mean the satellite, Jason 2 said 35.2 feet for 15 reading average with a single max measurement at 38.7 feet. So that's right on track. And then going forward, we see here's the peak of the storm. No satellite passes near its core, but that was, I think it was 46 feet or so. 
40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, yeah, about 46. And then you can see, oh, there we go. And another pass, 18Z on Tuesday, right over the core of the storm. It was already starting to fade. It had, oh, what was that, 30, 32, 34, 36, 37, 38, let's say 39 foot seas. Sure enough, ax, max average measurement said 39.6 feet with a peak reading at 45.7 feet in there so model did quite good oops and yet even one more you get the general idea that was about 32 feet max average 31 with a peak to 36 and then things pretty much faded out from there so the model did a good job sea heights confirmed per the satellite just the way we want to see it and swell from that system is in the water, pushing towards California. And as we said before earlier, when the system was south of New Zealand, that swell has already hit Hawaii and is probably starting to fade by now. Anyway, so let's look ahead. What's coming? Okay, first system. We saw it pushing up into the Tasman Sea. 18Z on Monday, 32-foot seas, and holding about in the 33-foot range. Fiji, where is it? Right up in there somewhere. Uh, energy looks to be well directed. You can literally watch the seas push up that way. Here comes the next system on Wednesday, 39 foot seas, building to 41 feet. And again, 40, about 40 feet, 41 feet late Wednesday, pushing up into the Tasman Sea, 40 foot seas. That's actually is an improvement. The 18Z run here looking better than the 12Z run. The 12Z run was better than the 6Z run. So uh, again, looking pretty good. And yet another system, a third system on Thursday night in the, what is that, 36 or so foot range. Oops, building to 38 feet but not pushing up into the Tasman Sea as well or as strong, and that fading out. So, and then after that, oh, here we go. We forgot to look over here in the far southeast Pacific and the system off of uh, 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 per, uh, Chile. None of it relative to California doing anything. Maybe maybe some sideband swell here, but that just doesn't even have 30-foot seas, probably not of any interest. So the real focus, again, as we said before, is in uh, the Tasman Sea relative to Fiji. Now, let's be clear, some of that energy, you can see it blowing by here. Uh, maybe we can get another, or just sort of go back and look here. You can see energy trying to blow by either side of Fiji. Small amounts of that energy will also reach Hawaii. We're not talking anything large, you know, maybe not even two foot at 18 seconds or something like that, but swell is swell, and from a rather southwest direction relative to the islands. So they'll get something out of it. California, be uh, lucky to see anything rideable from it. Then finally, looking at wind forecast and potentially wind swell relative to Hawaii in California. Right now, Sunday, high pressure, 1026 millibar, north-northeast of the islands, ridging in the U.S. west coast, generating uh, the standard summertime, June gloom, uh, northwest wind-driven sort of situation, gradient along the coast, 15 to 20 uh, knot northeast winds, a lot of uh, overcast along the coast, nothing beautiful at all. Trades also for Hawaii, 15, maybe a little bit, uh, maybe pushing 20 knots at times. Good for short period wind swell. Uh, same thing for California, short period junky wind swell. Uh, more continuing into Monday. Trades look to be fading, some relative to why. Low pressure builds in the Gulf of Alaska, but literally in the North Pacific, there's nothing that's going to generate any swell. You won't even get 30 knot winds. Uh, the gradient over California continues on Tuesday, but starts lifting north. Some sense that winds are going to start uh, slacking off along the central coast as we get later into Tuesday. Uh, trades also lose their uh, depth of field relative to why wind swell backs off there. And as we get into Wednesday, a rather light northwest wind pattern along the California coast, maybe 5 to 10 knots. Um, new high pressure building further out, but also weak low pressure building uh, to the east of that uh, 1030 millibar high. Trades picking up again relative to why good for wind swell. California light wind pattern continues. You know, this 20, 20 knot plus winds. Not really aimed at Hawaii, but maybe good for some wind swells we get in Thursday. That continues. Light winds along the California coast Thursday. Friday, south winds actually build. There's the remnants of the low pressure now. Um, south winds, 10 knots, maybe something like that as we get into Friday. And still, it fades. 
and everything's pretty light. No winds. Trades continue for a while. Light winds along the California coast until you get into maybe Sunday. High pressure starts ridging along the coast, and then we start again with the wind machine as we get into Monday. So uh, nothing really uh, interesting in terms of wind swell. The good news is winds to lighten up along the California coast about in sync with the southern hemi swell arrival. Uh, trade steady for Hawaii. Let's look further out. What's going on with the Madden Julian Oscillation and El Nino La Nina? See where we're going. First off, we start looking for the MJO, specifically the active phase of the MJO is what we want to see. Any evidence of that would be a good sign. The active phase in summer months really doesn't do a whole lot, but sometimes it indirectly feeds the jet stream in the southern hemisphere, specifically uh, helping to promote storm uh, formation in the area of New Zealand in the New Zealand corridor. Right now, this the, we're looking at winds from the TA buoy array, five-day average winds. Here's the equator, West Pacific here, East Pacific here. There's New Guinea, and the arrows are what we're looking at, not water temperatures. That's what the numbers are. East trades in control, pretty strong, but lighter over the far West Pacific. It's the Kelvin wave generation area from 135 east, 5 degrees north and south of the equator, out to about 170 west. This area right here we call the Kelvin wave generation area. That is when there's an, a solid active phase of the MJO. It can suppress trades in this area, and that in turn helps promote warm water, typically pooled up in the West Pacific, to slosh east under the equator down about 100 meters and form what's known as a Kelvin wave. Uh, anyway, looking at anomalies, differences from normal for this time of year, the arrows you're looking, they're neither east nor west. Kind of a new, this is kind of a normal wind pattern for this time of year. And you go over into the Kelvin wave generation area, eh, maybe weak, little bit easterly right in this area here. But as you get further over, pretty much a normal wind pattern. No clear sign of the active phase of the MJO. So next we look at zonal wind anomaly forecasts. This is the whole planet on one chart, um, but the Kelvin wave generation area, the date line's right down the middle of the chart. Kelvin wave generation area between these two tick marks. This is April 20th, and you see moving closer to the current time. So you can just look down this line here where you see reds and yellows. That means westerly anomalies. So that was probably the active phase of the MJO into about May 10th. Then you see blues suggesting easterly anomalies, suggesting the inactive phase of the MJO. And here's where we are today. A very strong pulse, supposedly, of easterly anomalies occurring right now. Now, this is not associated with the inactive phase of the MJO, and we'll get into that in a minute. But there's a, uh, um, a Rossby wave, an equatorial Rossby wave moving through this area, and that can interact, too, and create short bursts of easterly winds. That's what we're seeing here. By about May 25th, that's supposed to peter out and returning to almost a normal pattern or if anything moving off to the east but as long as it's out of the kelvin wave generation area that's what we really want we do not want to see strong easterly anomalies for like a long period like this for a multi-week window one week we can tolerate as long as it fades pretty quick and that looks like what's going to happen so other signs of the MJO, we look at forecasts. Here's a two-week model, outgoing long wave radiation. So another way to uh, monitor the active phase is you would like to see normally low pressures associated with the active phase, more precipitation, more clouds. So the yellows and oranges, here's the Kelvin wave generation area. Where there's the equator running right there, South America, Australia, New Guinea. Kelvin wave generation area, 135 east out to about 170 west right in there we see oranges and yellow that means more sunlight reflectivity that means high pressure that means the inactive phase of the mjo so that's probably what's going on right now no big surprise and that's to continue this per the statistical model into about the next 10 days or so and then theoretically it fades and a weak active phase sets up moving into the kelvin wave generation area and west pacific now the GEFS model, the dynamic model, suggests no, the inactive phase, if anything, is supposed to hold position and just sort of fade and stall there for the next two weeks. So sort of a discrepancy. One model suggesting the active phase of the MJO, another suggesting the inactive phase of the MJO. A bit of a toss-up, too early to know. Phase diagram charts from the ECMF model, which we assume is the equivalent of the statistical model, and the GEFS model, certainly a dynamic model. So see this chart? Looking, assume you're looking down on the north pole of our planet, and the MJO moves on the equator from west to east from the Indian Ocean 
over the maritime continent, say like Bali, over the West Pacific, over the Dateline, which is roughly right about here, and then across the Pacific, under the United States, across the Atlantic, through North Africa, back to the Indian Ocean. Round and round she goes. Heavy dots where the active phase of the MJO is right now, or basically on the other side of the planet from where we want it to be, basically in the... Uh, in the West Indian Ocean, the green track is where it's supposed to go. And per this, the statistical model, ECMF, it's supposed to track over the Indian Ocean, through the maritime continent, and not very strong, but almost trying to make its way towards the West Pacific two weeks out. But the GEFS model, Dynamic, says, no, it's going to pretty much stay in the Indian Ocean, not move as quick as what the other model says, and it's basically have no effect in the Pacific for the next two weeks. So again, ambiguity prevails. The upper level 40-day model, so the oranges and yellows suggest uh, lack of precipitation, uh, suppression of precipitation. The greens are so, uh, areas supported for precipitation. So one can assume this is the inactive phase of the MJO. There's New Guinea there. There's the equator. There's South America there. So the inactive phase of the MJO moving into Central America through about June 4th. About that time, a weak active phase develops. It, too, makes its traverse across the Pacific and pushes into Central America. Well, actually, right about there, Ecuador and the Galapagos on, let's say, late June, June 24th. And then another act, uh, inactive phase starts developing in the West Pacific at about June 19th and continues east from there. And then, of course, our favorite model, the CFS, it goes out three months. Um, so this is past history here. Big uh, uh, um, act, uh, active phase of the MJO. You can see that right between 120 east, 180. So basically in this area going up the chart is the Kelvin wave generation area. Big active phase of the MJO occurred back in February. But here's where we are today. You see easterly anomalies right there. Right? And they're supposed to be very short-lived, maybe another four or five days. And then what you see when you look up in the Kelvin wave generation area, so right along in here, is pretty much westerly anomalies in control with uh, no real easterly anomalies suggested until you get to about, oh, 170 east or beyond. So the bulk of the Kelvin wave generation area is to be full of westerly anomalies. Let's go ahead and overlay the MJO. So here we are, inactive phase of the MJO, the dotted contour, supposed to hold in the Kelvin wave generation area into about oh, the end of May, let's say. But notice, westerly anomalies start building, even though the inactive phase is, is in control in the Kelvin wave generation area. A little bit of an active phase, but nothing really, not until you get into late June. And then it, it takes root, westerly anomalies in control. And then even after that, another week, we're talking July, August time frame, another week inactive phase of the MJO, but westerly anomalies hold. Why is that? Well, we have the low-pass filter, and the solid contour suggests the area uh, favorable for, yeah, we'll call it a low-pressure bias. We've talked about this before. In the dotted contour, if you go back last year, you can see it was pretty much filling in January. The Kelvin wave generation area, this would be a high-pressure bias, and that, you can say, is, a, is a, the equivalent of La Nina. But as we get even where we are here now, the low-pressure bias is completely filling the Kelvin wave generation area, and expected to continue into the fall and beyond, suggesting the death of La Nina, and at least a return to a normal pattern, or maybe a pattern biased slightly in favor of El Nino. We're not saying El Nino, just the atmosphere is to have a little bit of a more of a push, and that'd be more favorable for storm development in winter months in the North Pacific, boding well for later in the fall and winter of this year, certainly compared to last year when we had the the uh, the tendency was towards La Nina. So let's take a look down in the ocean. Now, we've talked enough about the atmosphere and MJO. Let's go talk longer term. What's going on with La Nina, if it exists at all? 
So water temperatures would be a good place to start, and subsurface water temperatures specifically. West Pacific here, East Pacific here. This is from the TAO buoy array from 2 degrees north to 2 degrees south along the equator across the entire uh, equatorial Pacific. The X's are, of course, the sensors on the anchor lines of the TAO buoy array. So from that data, you can kind of model and get a sense of what the temperature profile looks like across the Pacific. Clearly, big bulge of warm water in the West Pacific. One would expect that with La Nina having been in play. But here's the cool thing. The 28-degree isotherm, it wasn't but three weeks or three or four weeks ago, it was completely aligned here on the date line. And now it moved from 170 to 165. And now it's almost to 160 west. That's a significant, what is that, 20 degrees? That's 1,200 miles that this patch of warmer water has moved off to the east. That is good news, suggesting that La Nina is losing its grip. Now, in the east, the 24-degree uh, isotherm, uh, you know, it made a big uh, surge, you know, it was a month and a half ago or so, and it's held steady about 35 meters deep, even up to the coast of Ecuador. Now, let's look at anomalies, dif anomalies, differences from normal for this time of year. And we did see during La Nina a large cool pool in the area, not minus one, minus two, even up to minus three degree anomalies below normal. That's all gone now. Instead, we have a Kelvin wave. Remember, we talked about that big uh, active phase of the MJO back in February, creating westerly, strong westerly anomalies here in the Kelvin wave generation area out in this area. Well, it pushed warm water to depth, and there it is, three degrees above normal, and a whole river of two degree anomalies are, have pushed the whole way across the Pacific into Ecuador now. No cool anomalies exist except maybe right in this area. And by cool, we're talking normal to maybe half a degree below normal. And where is that? From about you know, 170 east to about 140 west, something like that. So we'll go take a look when we get to the surface chart to see if that's really the case. Also looking at the GODAS data, another model using the same raw data, a little bit higher res model. You get a better picture of what's going on. Uh, so we still see the core of our Kelvin wave, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. So barely four degrees above normal, mostly three degrees above normal with that, that whole river of warm water making it to 100 west. But notice it really hasn't reached the surface, just barely teasing right at about 105 west. And a tiny little pocket of the last of La Nina cool anomalies uh, sitting right here uh, off the coast of Ecuador. But otherwise, basically, there is no hope for La Nina given this scenario. And the assumption is this warm water is pushing off to the east. But we've seen some data from some other scientific sources that say Maybe it's not so much pushing off to the east, but it's almost like a steady state. It's just sitting there, not going anywhere. Like it really needs another burst of westerly anomalies to kind of nudge it in. And that sort of seems to see what be what's going on. And we'll get into that in just a second. Sea level anomalies, just another way to confirm uh, subsurface water temperatures. This is from the Jason 2 satellite uh, data. Just strip out all the sea, the waves, the wind swell, the tides. And you see what you have is a plus 5 to plus 10 centimeter bump along the equator here. And what that means is warm water at depth expands. It sort of pushes the, bumps the ocean's surface up a little bit higher than normal, suggesting warm water at depth. And that goes the whole way off to about 100 west. There's the Galapagos right there. Ecuador is right there. And from looking at the other charts, we knew that that Kelvin wave made it to right about here and stalled. And that's kind of what this data is suggesting. Upper ocean heat anomaly data, same sort of data. West Pacific here, East Pacific here, time last year. See below normal temperatures, the blue uh, in September, October, last fall. That's La Nina. But a Kelvin wave here in uh, late December pushed across the Atlantic, I mean the Pacific, sorry. Very weak, kind of faded, but you notice it like cut the legs out of La Nina. Then there was the upwelling phase of the Kelvin wave cycle. And now the current Kelvin wave, remember that big active phase of the MJO back in February, created warm water pushing east. And here's where we are today, steady state Kelvin wave, if you will. You're not really leaching to the surface, but plenty of warm water at depth. Was that half to one degree? Well, we know it's more than that because we saw that this is over averaged over 300 meters. So there's still cooler water at the surface. Most of this water, warm water, is at depth. But it's holding. 
no sign that it's disappearing. So now, now let's go look at sur ocean surface temperature anomalies. Differences from normal this time of year. Not unusual along Peru to see upwelling. Trades a little bit above normal. Just stirring up deep ocean water. But we know that there's not a large, vast reservoir of cool water in that area. We know the Kelvin wave, gener the Kelvin wave is hovering under this area to about, about 100 west. Somewhere in there, maybe 95. There's the Galapagos. So we see... Yeah, kind of this mixed light warming pattern over the equator. No real signs of La Nina at all. And the warming goes down to about, what's that, about 3 degrees south roughly with a little bit broader pocket here uh, out at 100 west down to about 12 south, something like that. This is probably right in here, the last little bits of La Nina's cool pool. So that, that's sort of a high-res view. And here's the trend over the past seven days. You can see warming from... Oh, right about 100, 105 west, out the whole way across the Pacific. Not strong warming, just this slow, what is this, maybe half a degree above normal uh, trend in this area, which is, so the normal El Nino uh, monitoring region, 120 out to about 170 west, 5 degrees north and south of the equator. So that's exactly what you want to see. Uh, no clear sign that La Nina is in control. Looking along the coast of Peru, yeah, a couple of spotty little uh, patches of cool anomalies, but nothing real strong. And a little sort of a general cooling trend south of the Galapagos, but nothing obvious. Sort of a steady state trend, really. And then the overview. Here's what's been going on compared to normal for this time of year. Yeah, a little bit of light cooling along Peru. No big deal. A little bit of light warming outside of there. Mixture of warming and cooling, but mainly the balance is warming on the equator over the Galapagos on out down to about 3 south. May, the main uh, Nino 3.4 region for monitoring El Nino would be right about in this area right there. And you see it's kind of a mixed bag, but on the balance I'd say it's a little bit pushing towards warmer, but probably neutral when it's all said and done. And this is the last little bit of La Nina down here. Let's go take a look at actual temperatures, both in the Nino 1.2 region, which would be out here, and then the Nino 3.4 region. And here we go in the Nino 1.2 region up there along Peru. Here you can see the trend in the past couple days. Right now we're a little over half a degree below normal, minus 0.686 right there. But you see we were up to half a degree above normal there uh, a week ago. And the trend, if you drew a line through us since uh, late March, has been steadily upwards. So there are pulses embedded here, given, uh, you know, depending on how the MJO affects things and other local conditions. Uh, this is not bad. I think at some point here in the next week or two, we'll probably start seeing an upward trend. And here's the trend in the official Nino 3.4 region. You can see also the trend is upward. Today's value were 1.172 degrees you know, maybe almost two-tenths of a degree below normal. And that's only because we're on a three-day downtrend. But at some point, this will pick up. And, and the assumption is we're, we're rapidly approaching completely normal in the Nino 3.4 region. So once we reach there, three months after that, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take three months for the atmosphere to sort of go, okay, La Nina's gone, and for it to rearrange itself. So three months from late May, that'd be May to June, July, August. As we get into late August, which is just in time for the start of fall or the very end of summer, you know, maybe the southern hemisphere will wake up a little bit more, and then also that will set us up for a pretty good run of fall surf, assuming all this goes as forecast. So let's go back and let's see what's going on in the atmosphere and see how the water temperatures over the equator are affecting the atmosphere. Right now, we look at, so we're looking at the southern oscillation index, difference in pressure over Darwin, I mean, T Tahiti and Darwin. Uh, today, the uh, index is 13.58, meaning higher pressure in the uh, Pacific, meaning the inactive phase of the MJO. And you can kind of just go back a couple days. You can see, yeah, we were trending negative, and now the four-day trend seems to be positive. 30-day average SOI, minus 2.92. You'd say, oh, that's the, the, inactive, the active phase of the MJO. But no, you can see we were up a little bit higher than that, I mean, lower than that. And the average is coming up. That means the active, the inactive phase of the MJO is in control. The 90-day average SOI also reflects that. You can see as we're as we're looking through the data here that the numbers are rising. So the 90-day average, more for monitoring El Nino, La Nina, suggests. Uh, 
Yeah, there were still, you know, it's new, basically neutral. If we were at 10 or 15, for sure that's La Nina, but we're not anywhere near that. But still, we're at 5, so we'll call it normal bias towards La Nina in the atmosphere by now. But we also know that we're just on the cusp of the ocean returning to normal, and we need three more months before we turn to probably a neutral index here. And then one other index, the ESPI index, what it does is measure instead of pressure differences, rainfall differences here over the main, sort of the Nino 3.4 region, but a broader area than that. Right now it's saying minus 0 0.78, and I think we were at minus 0 0.4 or 3.8 or something, so it's actually gotten drier in this area the past uh, four or five days. That's not particularly good, uh, but all that could mean is that La Nina, you know, or the inactive phase of the MJO is sort of having its effect and kind of drying things up a little bit. This goes in cycles as well and is influenced by the MJO, but what we want to see is this guy start averaging around zero, and we just haven't got there. We got up to about minus four or so, or minus 0.4, sorry, um, but we have not reached the zero mark yet, meaning La Nina is still in control of the global atmospheric circulation. And then finally, the forecast for the Nino 3.4 region, sea surface temperature anomalies. So uh, we have been negative. That was, of course, La Nina. And where are we now? We're about mid to late May, which would be right about in the middle here. And that's right about when temps are supposed to return to normal. And if anything, as we get in July, maybe two tenths of a degree above normal, and then slowly rising from there to maybe point uh, four tenths of a degree below normals, uh, above normal, I'm sorry, four tenths of a degree above normal as we get into the fall, and maybe up to uh, a half a degree above normal, which would be borderline El Nino as we get into January, something like that. Other models, a little bit more positive. This is probably the most pessimistic of all the models. There's a... Yeah, some are saying a 50% chance that uh, we could get into some sort of a bare, minimal, uh, Madoki, El Nino sort of situation for this winter. Um, but, uh, you know, either way, we're not La Nina, and none of the models are saying any sort of a hint of La Nina. We're going to say probably no El Nino, and that'd probably be fine. The ocean needs more time to recharge, build up some more heat energy. But once we get over this threshold right here, we got to get out of the spring unpredictability barrier, too. So once we get in, that runs, I'm, I'm trying to remember, I think it's in, in the February to uh, the 1st of June sort of time frame. Uh, so once you get into June 1, then the models get a bit more of a handle on what's going on in the atmosphere. So, and, and then we'll kind of see how this all sorts out, and we have a better sense of whether we're going to get any kind of an El Nino, just a neutral pattern going into this fall. But either way, it's better than La Nina. So to wrap things up, right now, solid swell in the water, uh, modest, modest sideband energy for why. Stronger swell is expected for California all through the week. Uh, that is good news. But after that, things go to sleep. The storm track focuses on Fiji and that area with uh, filtered energy into Hawaii. Whole series of storms through the Tasman Sea, that's good. Otherwise, we're just waiting. La Nina, for the most part, is dead. But no act strong active phases are forecast. No strong westerly wind bursts are forecast. Nothing to really push us into an El Nino situation. So it looks like it's going to be just a slow demise for La Nina, setting us up for normal to maybe just slightly above normal water temperatures as we get into the late fall, global atmospheric circulation changing at that time, and things should be off to a normal start of the fall season for the Pacific uh, come you know, August, late August, early September. So that's it for this week. We'll do it again next week. Same time, same channel. Thanks for watching.